Good morning and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first official event of the Governing for Reform in Aged Care program. Today marks the commencement of enrolments and learning within the program. My name is Nikki Doyle, partner at KPMG within our health, ageing and human services sector, and I will be facilitating the discussion today. I would like to begin by welcoming my colleague and collaborator on this program, Trevor Sator from Ninti One, who will lead us through the acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Nikki. My name is uh, Trevor Sator. Hi, everyone. I work for Ninti One, and I'm pleased to provide the acknowledgement for this important virtual event. I'm based in Catherine, but was born and bred in Alice Springs. Uh, Catherine is uh, near my mother's country. My tribal affiliations are with Sar Southern Aranta uh, Paternal and Gurunji Maternal. So locally, I live and work in Catherine on Dudaman, Jarwin and Wadaman land and pay my respects to their traditional owners and elders as custodians and original owners and also pay respect to emerging leaders. I recognise that culture is ongoing. A uh, big shout out too to any Indigenous uh, people that might be uh, watching this event. We can all then acknowledge and pay respect to traditional owners, elders and emerging leaders on whatever land you're watching this event from or where you live and work as well. The Aged Care Reform Project is no doubt important for this country going forward. It is incredibly important for many of our peoples, especially where many are in remote, rural and regional Australia and facing difficult access and service challenges. In the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander context, we can think that improvements in governance and leadership around aged care will throw, flow through to improvements in not only aged care outcomes, but in the community at large. The indirect effect of applying new thinking and practice is better and stronger community. So I wish you well in the rest of this event and may you find it worthwhile and for the rest of your aged care journey. Good luck. And now I'll hand back to Nikki. Thank you very much, Trevor. Today marks an important milestone in the reform of the aged care sector with the commencement of the Governing for Reform in Aged Care program. The program is designed specifically for members of governing bodies and executives of Commonwealth Government funded residential and home care approved providers. The commitment across the sector to drive meaningful change and enhance the care for older Australians has been phenomenal and is demonstrated by the impressive lineup of speakers and panel members here today. As part of the agenda this morning, we will hear a message from Senator um, Richard Colbeck, the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, who is unable to attend but has provided a message to officially open the Governing for Reform in Aged Care program. I know many of you um, who have joined us today are interested to hear from the sector leaders, Mike Baird, Anne Skipper and Marie McCabe in our panel discussion on the challenges and opportunities faced by governing boards and executives as they navigate major reform. Following the discussion, I look forward to welcoming Janet Anderson, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner, to talk about the importance of the Governing for Reform in Aged Care program and to share her own perspectives on the role of governing bodies and executives in influencing and leading this significant change. Finally, we will share details about the program and how to enrol. A few housekeeping announcements um, to help us uh, navigate through the next hour. So first of all, today's session will be recorded and the link will be provided in a post webinar email. If you have any questions during the event, please post them into the Q&A box. While we are not running a live Q&A session today, questions will be captured and answered in a Q&A document, which will be shared in the post webinar email. Likewise, you will see a QR code located on the bottom left of your screen. When you scan with your mobile, this will actually take you to the Governing for Reform in Aged Care Enrolment page and automatically um, help you to sign up during the webinar. So please feel free to use that as we are going through the webinar to help you actually enrol in the program. 
Before we formally commence today's proceedings, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank each of you for joining us today, and also to thank you for the role that you play in leading and strengthening the aged care sector. For myself personally, I focus on ageing in the work that I do, as for me, being able to undertake work that enables older Australians to continue to live their lives as they age in the way that they want to, with the quality of life that they want and deserve, is incredibly important to me and has been from the start of my career. Each older Australian has lived a long, valuable and unique life. And for me, it's imperative that we support them as they reach the end of their life, respecting their beliefs, their wishes and their individuality. Every single leader within aged care plays a vital role in supporting this and also in delivering safe and quality care for older Australians. And part of that is about working together to strengthen corporate and clinical governments. I would now like to welcome the Honorary Richard Colbeck via video link to formally open the Governing for Reform in Aged Care program and today's session. Thank you, Nikki, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning for this important event. Today's webinar focuses our minds on the importance of strong, capable leadership and robust governance of aged care services. The need for this has never been more clearly demonstrated than in recent times as the sector has tackled bushfire threats, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and then the devastating flooding that has affected so many services, consumers and staff in Queensland and New South Wales. Knowing how challenging the last two to three years have been for the sector, I want to take a moment now to acknowledge and thank all aged care providers, their staff and volunteers for the work that you do day in, day out, caring for and supporting older Australians. It has been a difficult time and we are truly grateful for your diligence and your commitment. Just over a year ago, the Royal Commission provided the Government with its comprehensive final report, Care, Dignity and Respect. Today, I'm very pleased to open this webinar on the Governing for Reform in Aged Care program. This is one of the many initiatives the Government is implementing from the Royal Commission's recommendations and one that I'm personally very committed to. The Government's additional financial commitment to the aged care sector and implementation of the ambitious five-year reform plan we have announced now totals more than $18.3 billion. This extra funding is enabling change to take place in relation to support at home, residential care, quality and safety, workforce and governance. These are the five key reform pillars of our reform program. The final report of the Commission had something to say on each of these aspects of aged care. In relation to governance, the Royal Commissioners identified variable provider governance and behaviour and the absence of system leadership and governance as systemic problems in the aged care sector which were negatively impacting the services being provided to aged care consumers. The Governing for Reform in Aged Care program has been designed to support the sector to strengthen organisational and cl clinical governance capability. Effective leadership and governance are essential for ensuring the safety and quality of care provided to older Australians. These leadership qualities are equally vital as enablers of change and for driving improvements and innovations across the sector. The Governing for Reform in Aged Care program is aimed at ensuring that all providers are well placed to participate in, progress and benefit from the reforms in the aged care sector. All of us share the same goal, to ensure that every consumer has a quality experience of aged care. This program is designed to help you achieve that goal. I would like to thank sector leaders Mike Baird and Skipper and Marie McCabe for participating in today's panel discussion. We look forward to hearing your views and insights into the factors that contribute to the effective governance and support the success of aid, the aged care reform agenda. The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has led the development of the program with their partner KPMG. 
Thank you to Commissioner Janet Anderson and your team for all the hard work that's gone into designing and building this program. I know there will be much more work put into its implementation. I encourage all members of governing bodies and executives of approved providers of residential and home care who are with us today to get in early and enrol in the program after the webinar. The program is free to all of those who are eligible to enrol and I hope you enjoy this morning's events. Thank you and I pass back to Nikki. Thank you, Minister Colbeck. Like Minister Colbeck, I'm also looking forward um, to hearing our panel members today. Our first panel member has extensive experience in highly scrutinised leadership and governance positions. Please welcome former New South Wales Premier, former National Australia Bank Executive and Chief Customer Officer, and current Hammond Care CEO, Mike Baird. Mike also holds credentials in executive management from Harvard and Duke University. Welcome, Mike. Our second panel member is a nurse, company director, governance consultant and campaigner for the rights of women and children in the world. Please welcome Anne Skipper, who is the chair of Silver Chain. Anne is passionate about leading and guiding organisations to embrace change by empowering people. Our final panel member is a recognised leader in the health and aged care sector with experience across the health, mental health and aged care sectors. Welcome Marie McKay, who is the CEO at Dementia Australia. Marie holds leadership credentials from the Oxford University and an MBA from Swinburne and has held a range of C-suite positions. So thank you to each of our panel members for being part of today. So the aged care sector tends to attract people who dedicate their careers to the improvement or enhancement of lives of others. And I think that's evident in terms of the introduction of our panel members today. Although rewarding, working in aged care is not without its challenges. So can I like to have ask my first question to the panel, and I'm interested to hear from each of you about what attracted you to working in either dementia or aged care. And Mike, can I start with you, please? Well, thanks, Nikki. thanks for the opportunity. Um, for me, it was pretty simple. It was a moment, and uh, the moment was when you know these hands um, handed across my mum, you know, to to the aged care sector, and um, that moment is something I will never ever forget. Um, there was uh, deep held kind of grief and fear in terms of the the degeneration that I'd, I'd seen in in my mum, and uh, to hand her across to people I didn't know in a system I didn't understand um, was something that was terribly, terribly hard. And uh, as a family, we wondered as we left the facilities, uh, are they going to care for mum the same way we would? And I think that uh, as I experienced in um, days and weeks and months, um, I saw uh, incredible people um, who were doing work that I hadn't really focused on or even been aware of until I saw it. And uh, I reflected time and again how Australia didn't really understand um, the significance, both of the work this was being done and also the value of our elderly. Um, so as I was um, coming towards a career moment, um, and at the age where I probably had a chance to do one or two more executive roles, uh, I really was looking for something with purpose. And when I was approached with aged care, well, I couldn't think of anything more perfect, um, how to spend the days um, to help caring for our dear, valuable elderly Australians, but also to support those that provide that care. Um, so it was a combination of personal um, and that desire professionally uh, to do something with significant purpose. And I can think of nothing more evil than, than what we do. Fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing that, Mike. And can I get what brought you here um, to your current role um, and other roles um, that you've done? Uh, thanks, Nikki, and it's wonderful to be here. Um, Nikki, as you said, I started life out as a nurse, um, and part of that uh, journey was uh, going into work with uh, the Royal District Nursing Service. So I did a stint in community-based community nursing, and I had the privilege, I think, of going into people's homes and uh, seeing them, 
and uh, and ensuring that they could stay in their homes longer by having good quality health care. Now that was some, um, gosh, nearly 50 years ago now, but um, my mother was also a great role model. Um, my mother was a nurse and uh, she started the first aged care service for people that lived in the inner city of Adelaide. And a lot of that was around not so much um, nursing care, but the isolation that so many pe older people feel and disconnected with their community. And she had these wonderful drop-in centres where uh, older people would go and socialise. And part of actually ensuring, I think, for me, was seeing um, their eyes light up when they had these social interactions. So for me, it was that really wonderful integrated care that I was exposed to so many years ago of looking after people in their homes and then also uh, the social connection as well. Um, I also did a, um, a stint with the Royal Flying Doctor Service and that took me into remote communities where for the first time I really saw um, how disparate some of those healthcare and social needs were, in, particularly around vulnerable people and aged care uh, in, in those sort of remote areas. So uh, it was a bit of a journey, um, as Mike said, um, and when the opportunity came up to uh, be on the board of Silver Chain and eventually chair it, what I loved and was passionate about the organisation was its integ integrated care model and looking after people in the home. So that was sort of the, that was sort of the driving force for me. Fantastic, thank you so much for sharing, Anne. Marie, what about you? Well, thank you, Nikki, and hello and welcome, everyone. It really was a personal experience that we uh, that happened for us with my dad. And I was actually, um, you know, my background was in mental health and in nursing, and we were seeing changes in dad that were inexplicable. He went from being incredibly active, he would train horses, he drove trucks, he, he was on the land, he was extremely active. And then one day he went and lied on the couch and that's where he stayed for a long, long time. And initially he was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, followed by depression, and then finally dementia with Lewy bodies. And it really was a significant challenge for him and particularly for my mum, who was caring for him. And mum had her own health challenges. She was living with, osteo with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and was in pain quite a bit of the time. And as dad's dementia progressed and he became less able to be independent and to do things for himself, there was um, a, a, an event where my mum had a stroke in the middle of the night and dad didn't know what to do. He had forgotten how to use a telephone. He couldn't go and get the neighbours for help. And when my sister arrived the following morning, he was sitting at the kitchen table crying, your mum, your mum. And my sister found mum, she called the ambulance and mum passed away 48 hours later. But I can only imagine the distress and the helplessness that my dad experienced. And I didn't want that to ever be the experience of another family. So that really was the impetus for me to work in the area of dementia and to work to make a difference. Fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing those. And thank you to all three of you for sharing those stories and particularly, um, particularly the fact that each three stories are very, very personal and deeply personal to you. And I think that reflects almost the journey of many, many people that I think uh, have joined us today, um, including myself. Just turning um, a little bit, um, and I want to come back to Minister Colbeck mentioned in his um, opening address about the Royal Commission and the report and the fact that there was variable provider governance behaviour and the absence of system leadership and governance within aged care. So just a question to Mike and Anne, and Anne, I'll start with you. In your viewpoint, which are the issues that require the most critical attention by governing bodies and executives and why? Um, well, I think, um, and I'll use Silver Chain as an example, uh, one of the critical uh, things around success is the clinical governance. And I think um, many organisations have a lot of processes and systems in place 
but it's actually the culture, the DNA of an organisation around providing best care every time. And it's trying to embed that culture in the organisation that makes a significant difference into the way uh, you provide the service, the way your uh, the older people or the customers, clients, which we want to call them, uh, interact with you. You have to have a wonder, you have to create an avenue that is, uh, it's a joint responsibility going into somebody's home. Um, we have a responsibility and so do they. And it's, it's about building that trust and that respect for each other, for what you provide. But that comes from uh, a, a good clinical governance framework a culture of doing the best thing every time and also creating a an openness about feedback sometimes it's positive sometimes it may not be positive and being open to that feedback and being open enough to actually delve into your own processes systems and people to actually work towards good to great so for me it is about um, some structures and processes good clinical governance, but it's about the openness, I think, and the transparency you have as a culture to be the best you can. Fantastic, thank you, Anne. Mike, turning to you, your thoughts. Well, I, I agree with Anne. I mean, I think that's um, absolutely right. I mean, the clinical governance process um, is a critical part of the quality care. Um, I think as I look at the, uh, the Royal Commission, to me there is a significant shift um, that moves from provider to consumer. Um, there, there really is now this understanding what is it um, the consumer needs, and that consumer can be broader family if the person is living with dementia and doesn't necessarily have the, the capacity to understand. Um, obviously we do everything we can to support, but um, the consumer, the families, uh, how can we help them? And they are going to have a huge array of um, opportunities going forward. You look at the reform. Um, at the moment, consumers can go out and they can go to um, telcos, electricity companies, phone companies have comparative prices, have relative performance, know where coverage is. Um, there's a whole range of information that's available. That's, that's coming to us. Um, you think of the star rating system that's coming. And I really like the star rating system because there's an onus on providers, you know, there's an onus on us to actually benchmark ourselves against others, not just here, but potentially around the world. And who is doing it best? You know, what can we learn from them? What is it we're not doing? Uh, and that's for everything from consumer experience through to clinical performance. Um, and and that's a is, is a really significant shift um, in mindset and approach um, to the sector. So I think that sort of governing bodies and leaders have to be prepared. What does that mean um, in terms of consumer experience? And are we ready? And at the moment, you know, how do we benchmark against others? And we have to be prepared to understand that and share that, which comes to the other point that Anne made, which is transparency. And that is something that we have to be very prepared to do. And I'm sure that Janet's gonna talk about this. We have to share all the information. You know, we have to understand how does our care minutes compare to others? How much are we spending on food, you know, as an example? How many complaints do we have? And how quickly are they being resolved? You know, that sort of public information puts an onus and accountability on the providers, but at the core is caring for our elderly uh, Australians. And we want to provide that best quality care. So we have to be transparent to others, to the regulator, to the community. And that's going to take a significant shift, I think, for the leaders. And, you know, we need to sort of prepare for that and, and understanding the voice of consumer as well. Um, the, the, how do we get the best possible feedback in real time and adapt in real time? You know, let's not wait for a quarterly or six months or a year later. How do we respond today um, to concerns that we're hearing from families in our facilities, uh, in our home care? Um, and I think that that's going to be a, a significant shift. Um, and with that comes skills. You know, what skills do we need in, in that new world and do we have them? and how do we apply them? And, and obviously technology, I can um, mention technology, that's also gonna be a, a critical feature in the delivery of care and how do we utilize that? And also the customer experience and, and how do we do that? Um, and the last one I'll make, which is kind of missed, uh, which is certainly important um, to Hammond Care is the, the physical environment. You know, with, with, within the recommendations, 
there is undoubtedly um, a push because it recommends the best way to care um, for our residents is in a cottage style environment. And you know, there's all types of research that talks significantly about reduced hospitalizations, improved quality of life. And you know, I think that's a challenge for the sector because the, those that don't have the cottage style environment, is there a capacity to do that? And how do you shift to that? Um, new facilities, um, sort of understanding the design that goes into the cottages and particularly um, those living uh, with dementia, but more broadly it's shown it is the best way to care. So that physical environment is also, I think, a challenge for, for the new leaders to think about. Um, so that's probably the, the package that I would reflect on here. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Anne. Lots, lots of food for thought for our governing bodies and executives. Marie, and this is slightly picking up on what Mike was just saying, but we all know that the number of people living with dementia in aged care is increasing. What's your perspective on what our governance systems and processes need to do to change to better support quality care for these individuals? I think, um, Vicky, I think that Anne and Mike just gave a really good answer. And I think, you know, the thing to cover about this is governing bodies often, you know, boards look at financial results and the sustainability of the organisation and risk, which is really important. And I think the area that needs to be added to this is around the clinical governance element and around the people. And we are in the business and have the privilege of caring for some of our most vulnerable and frail Australians. And transparency around this is key and looking at some of the clinical indicators as well and being driving a culture of being a learning organisation. And because we have an increase in incidents, say falls, for example, it is not necessarily a bad thing. It may be that there's been education about reporting and what we have is better reporting. And what we're allowing people is the dignity of risk. We're allowing them to walk around and not be, uh, you know, stuck in a chair all day or, you know, being restrained in some way from doing the things that are important to them. And transparency around this is also key. And Mike mentioned other, other industries, of course, that can be benchmarked and we need to be going through that as well. And it happened in the acute sector. And following on from that is really the opportunity for us as an industry to drive cultural change, to be more transparent, to ensure that we support our workforce by elevating their skills, their knowledge. And I think the thing that many people don't realise is that of the 320,000 Australians living in residential aged care, more than 70% have moderate to severe cognitive impairment. And we have not related to dementia as core business. And it's one of the shifts in our leadership and governance that really does need to occur. And certainly with the federal government's allocation of funding last year in the federal election, um, you know, $17 billion into aged care and $220 million, $224.9 million into dementia care, it is absolutely essential that we make sure that we adopt the principles that are so important that have come from the Royal Commission and certainly fulfil on the roadmap for quality dementia care that has been laid down and presented and funded by the government. So Marie, in short, dementia is core business for everyone that is in aged care and that includes our governing bodies and executives. Absolutely. And one of the key places to look to see that it is, is our board agenda and what's on our board agenda. So but um, that I think is absolutely essential. Fantastic, thank you, Maureen. Mike, I've got a question for you. We've been talking about where we need to go, what might be some of the issues that need attention, but are there things that governing bodies and executives need to unlearn or let go of in order to properly embrace the challenges that comes with this once in a generation reform for aged care? Yeah, Nick, look, I, th I think the, un the unlearning um, is there is going to be a different way of engaging and a, and a different way of acting. And that that's both in terms of the governing, um, the day to day and engagement with our sort of families going forward. So I think the challenge is we're comfortable with what we're doing. And uh, you know, I, I just love what Marie said, because I think 
if we're transparent, you know, with our families and the community and, you know, everyone that's, that's looking at the work we're doing, um, it, you've got more chance of winning the partnership and the respect sort of long term. So you're right. I mean, those living with dementia, there could be a, a risk decision that we're happy for this resident to, to walk around, notwithstanding there's risk of fall because of the quality of life. But you've got to be transparent with that information. Um, and I guess that one of the challenges is uh, you, we want it to be simple, customer friendly, but we also want to reflect the complexity of this aged care. It's about individuals and how we care for them deeply. Um, so in terms of unlearning, it's what we have done before hasn't delivered the best outcomes. You know, I think that's the honest appraisal. You know, we've seen examples where we've fallen short. Um, so the onus is on all of us is there is a new opportunity to deliver the best possible care we can. What is it we need to change? What is it we need to focus on? And, you know, from my point of view, whether it be engagement with the consumers, um, whether it be engagement, you know, with our staff, you know, are we providing the right sort of education? And we've heard about dementia. Dementia is core business for everyone. Um, but does everyone deeply understand the best possible dementia care? And are we providing that consistently across all facilities? Um, so I think it's really what we need is a mindset. I think in days gone past, reform would just bring challenges, additional paperwork, and I don't know whether this is going to work. You know, my sense is change that to say, what are the opportunities here? And I think if we grasp the reform, there is an opportunity for us to deliver much better quality care. Um, and that means there's onus on all of us as leaders to be prepared to change. And if you haven't got that mindset, you, you're going to struggle, I think. Thanks, Mike. So the Australian government's vision for our future aged care system will require us to reshape our strategies, our processes, and in particular, our culture. And I think reflecting back on um, Anne's responses, Mike's responses, and Marie's responses, there's been a really strong theme around that culture that we need to change and reshape. We need to do that so that we could create a system that is easy to understand, easy to navigate, that is accessible for everyone, regardless of where they live and what care they want to access and fit for purpose for the needs of the people it cares for. It's a big ask. Our audience here today are leaders with influence within the sector and have a very, very important role in leading that really significant change. So a question for each of the panel, and Marie, I will come to you first. What do we each need to do to ensure that we are collaborating um, and with older Australians, their loved ones in the community in order to restore the confidence um, that the community needs to have in our aged care sector. Nikki, the past two years, as everybody knows, has been absolutely extraordinary and it has been an incredibly difficult time, especially for aged care providers in trying to balance safety and wellbeing and dealing with staffing shortages. I think the collaboration is Collaboration is key and particularly with consumers and we should not underestimate the consumer movement. And over the past few years, that has certainly gained impetus, it has gained strength and it has gained credibility. And ensuring that consumers are part of and that we collaborate with and that our services and programs are informed by their needs and wants is a really critical part. And it is part of also having a competitive advantage in the marketplace. And, you know, one of the things that is important for us as a sector is, you know, when we are dealing with frail, elderly and vulnerable people and incidents are going to happen. Bad things happen in good places, despite people's very best efforts. How we communicate that is absolutely essential and that we are transparent about those things and that we share about what we will do to prevent them happening again makes a very big difference. And consumers are absolutely key in that process, in informing them about what's happening, in the collaboration about the development of services, changes that they want to see made, and also in how they want to best be treated and to participate in their care to truly have person-centered care. Fantastic. Thank you, Marie. Um, 
Anne, your thoughts? Um, I just want to build on um, both what Mike and Marie have said. I think one of the big opportunities, and Mike touched on this, is being open-minded. And I think that starts at boards. I think it starts at executive. Um, what that means to me is you've got to listen more and engage more. Uh, you know, so I think part of that is being um, open to opportunities, open to the fact that things are, you do have risks, you do have challenges, you will have to meet them. I think the other part that needs to occur for me is the sector needs to be a lot more agile and we are going to have to live in what I call times of ambiguity. Uh, it's not no longer set and forget. We are in a world of change and it's constant change. So I think people need, our executives and boards need to be nimble, need to be have the ability to move quickly, make decisions quickly and respond to situations as they emerge. And I think COVID has shone the light on that for all of us, that we had to shift and change very, very quickly for all of us in, in the sector particularly. Um, I think the third thing um, I'd really stress is the collaboration and developing partnerships and being open to what you're good at as an organisation and where do you go to get the other part in somebody's life, namely dementia care, residential care, whatever. We can't be all good at all things, but what do we excel at? What's our one value proposition? And then who do we partner with to actually have that whole of life experience for a person with, uh, for an older person? And I think the other, the fourth thing for me is around really valuing choice and really listening to consumers as and older people as to what they want. What are the processes we need to set up and, the, and genuinely engage with them and genuinely listen to them? So they're my four key points, Nikki. Fantastic. Thank you, Anne. Um, Mike, how have you, what else would you like to add? Um, look, I think there's a um, there's probably three three points that, that I reflect on here. Um, the, I think the board and leaders have to ask this question, uh, what are they doing? Um, and that's the sense of looking across the sector, who does what best and how can we learn from them? I mean, I'll, I'll have board members that will actually send me little notes at times saying, I've heard about what this provider is doing or this event, you know, are we looking at that? And that's the right mindset, I think. Um, we can get better by learning from others who are doing it best across all types of things. And, um, you know, I, I, I think there's a desire for self-improvement. And if you, if you go back to the start system, you know, that's, that ultimately gives us a platform and an opportunity for us to be better. We don't need government to tell us. We don't need Janet and the commission to tell us. We've got the capacity as providers to be better. We can see where we're not necessarily at the top the top or best in class. That is something that, that, that leaders should be asking, you know, what can I learn and how can I be better? And that, that, that I think would be a significant shift. I mean, there's others doing amazing things uh, with quality indicators. There's others doing amazing things in customer experience and digital interaction. And how do we do that and learn from that? Um, the second is, I think, really important. You need um, to, to get to the front line yourself. Um, I've learned more in the time I've spent in the front line um, than I have in reading papers. And, you know, we're taking our board um, out to our mobile. We we'll take them out to one of our facilities, next board meeting. Um, we're going to hear from our care staff. We're going to hear from our managers. Um, we're going to meet um, residents and families. Just immerse yourself, you know, in the detail of what is happening and hearing. Um, and I think by its nature, that's going to help you to improve, you know, the, the quality and the safety of care that you're providing. And I, and I think that also restores confidence to the families when they see um, kind of leaders sort of active and moving and engaging um, and not necessarily staying in a head office style environment. Um, I think that's that's kind of a really important thing. Um, you know, the last is, you know, I really think um, we have a role to collectively talk up uh, the wonder and the incredible work, you know, of our workforce. And, you know, the, there is a media depiction um, of all the challenges and problems in aged care. 
Um, whereas I think all of us, and there's so many leaders on the line, every single one of them, I think, would stand up and give a story of incredible work. They've seen the last 24 hours, you know, let alone last weeks and months, and particularly given how tough the past weeks are. I mean, they're almost heroes. And I think the part of the narrative we have to do is to remind Australians of the incredible work being done, and just as importantly, that this is an amazing career where you can impact and change lives. And I think part of the collaborations with government to help us to sell that story and tell that story, because I think many Australians might shy away because of the fear of some of the story, but there is incredible work and it, and it is something that is life changing. And that's, that's pretty rare. So I think, you know, all of those, I think would give us a real opportunity. Fantastic. Thank you very much for those insights. So we are here today to actually open the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission's governing for reform in aged care program. So based on your experience, why should members of governing boards and executives do the program? And I will start with you, please. Um, I, think, I think it's about learning. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to immerse yourself into a learning opportunity to explore in an environment that is safe and, you know, uh, of an educative nature, to find out more about what you don't know. I mean, we always feel we do know everything, particularly as board directors and executives, but there are things we learn from other people and other organisations. And I think my word is, how do you go from being good to great? So for me, it is about that. I think the other thing is that um, we, you develop partnerships and, and, and connections, and, and that is a valuable thing in this sector. Uh, I think for so long we have been somewhat isolated, and I think it, this is a, a great opportunity for the sector to embrace what Mark was saying. What are the areas that we can actually come, come to the fore on? It has to be around our workforce and our people. It has to be about promoting the good work that we do. It has to be about, and the voice of, you know, one to 2,000 providers is very powerful. So I think those three things, I think, for me, are why, why people should sign up. Fantastic, thank you, Anne. Mike, very briefly, your thoughts, why should people sign up? Uh, because Janet thinks it's a good idea. <laughs> 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 um, no, it's it's built. It's exactly that. Um, I mean, we my leadership team did a, an experiencing dementia workshop. Um, we did that two weeks ago, and I think for the first time I really understood, you know, what it might be like. You know, just just an insight what it might be like living with dementia, and there was this deep determination that came from the leadership team. We have to do more. We have to be better, and that's what this is about. You know, this is an opportunity for us to be the best we can be. And, you know, for those that are providing, and we've obviously got many groups supporting, to have the capacity to be better, uh, to deliver the best quality care to our elderly Australians, well, that's motivation for everything and every day. So I, I think this is a fantastic initiative. And I likewise look forward to learning from so many. I found the sector so generous, I'm so willing to share. Um, and I think if we do that, purposely, um, we can be something that, that Australia can be proud. And I think all of us want to do that. Fantastic, thank you. And Marie, finally, why do you think that, um, that governing um, boards and executives should complete the program? Well, um, Nikki, the future has arrived. And I think that this really is a fabulous opportunity to get ahead of the curve, to improve the quality of care for people living with dementia in aged care and all people living in aged care. And to be part of that really is an honour and a privilege. Fantastic. Um, Thank you to each of our three panellists. For me, that was abs absolutely fascinating discussion. Some of my key takeouts that I've written down here as I've been listening very attentively, um, there is a real need for us to have openness and transparency um, throughout the work that we do. And that came across in many different ways in terms of the points that each of our panellists was making. Um, the ability to listen and engage, and, and that came through very strongly as well, and that was with to our consumers, our families, our communities, but also within our organisations as well. And um, 
also the fact that dementia is absolutely core business from everyone, regardless of whether you are delivering home care or residential care, dementia has to be core business. Um, and I think also the other thing um, to pick up is Mike's comments about, well, who does what best? And acknowledging that we all can't be the best at everything, but likewise, we can learn from each other. And there's a real opportunity for us to actually be able to do that through the Governing for Reform program. So thank you, um, Anne, Marie and Mike, for your authenticity and your amazing insights. It's, um, these conversations are really important um, for us as a sector to actually move forward and to grow. As a reminder to every, all our participants, the link to this conversation um, and the webinar will be provided via email following the event. Please feel free to share the link with your network and encourage your fellow leaders to join the conversation as well as the Governing for Reform program. That concludes our panel conversation for today. Any questions or comments posted in the webinar chat um, in relation to this discussion will be collated and responded to and shared um, and shared with yourselves via the post-webinar email. I would like to provide a very warm welcome to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner, Janet Anderson, to reflect on the panel discussion and talk about the role of governing bodies and executives in leading the transformation of the sector. Welcome, Commissioner. Oh, thanks, Nikki, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, wasn't that fantastic? Uh, I really did enjoy that panel session. Uh, thank you, by the way, to all of you for participating. I know it can be difficult to uh, set aside this sort of time in a busy week, uh, but it, I, I am encouraged by the number who are online uh, because it suggests to me that there is a level of interest in what we're trying to deliver through the governing for, aged, uh, for reform in aged care. Um, Nikki's reflected on some of the panel discussions, so I might move on because I do want to allow time for her to uh, step us through some of um, the, the outline of the program itself. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the minister mentioned two fundamentals which underpin the Governing for Aged Care Reform Program. The first is that effective leadership and governance are essential for ensuring the safety and quality of care provided to old Australians. And the second, which is equally important, is that those same qualities of leadership and governance are, are vital as enablers of change and for driving improvements in the practice and outcomes of care. And I think Anne and Mike both reflected on this in some of their comments. So that's why we think the Governing for Aged Care Reform Program is such an important piece of work and one that we're so enthusiastic that, that all of you uh, get the chance to participate in. Now, uh, as the aged care regulator, the commission I lead places a lot of importance on understanding and assessing a provider's governance performance when we assess compliance with the regulatory requirements. Um, and as you know, uh, there is a whole standard called organisational government, standard eight, uh, that we uh, pay particular attention to when we're looking at uh, governance arrangements. We also look at complaints, we look at serious incident re uh, reports, um, matters such as uh, preparations and readiness for a COVID-19 outbreak at a particular site. And we use all of those to create a risk profile for a service uh, and for a system. Uh, and it certainly enables us to engage more intensively with services which we consider to be at higher risk. And then we publish data around that um, routinely and, and with increasing uh, comprehensiveness. Legislative change has been proposed. Uh, it is a bill which is still before the Senate uh, and we will know its fate by the end of this month, but it does propose the introduction of additional requirements that will apply to aged care provider boards. And that has to do with the composition and expertise of boards um, and with the requirements placed on them for the establishment of uh, certain committees of quality care advisory body uh, to uh, provide additional reporting uh, both to the Commonwealth Department of Health, the Commission, and to the wider public. And that goes squarely to the issue that all three of the panellists mentioned in relation to the value of increasing transparency. Let people know how you're going and be candid about it in order to engage and to offer the opportunities of mutual learning. So speaking of opportunities of improvement, to, to paraphrase a very wise man, Martin Luther King Jr. A true measure of leadership is not what someone says and does in moments of comfort 
and convenience when things are easy, but how they act at times of challenge and controversy. Well, there's no doubt that we have been uh, inundated uh, with challenges in recent times, fire, plague, storm and tempest, flood, and, and those are only the natural disasters and, and uh, public health emergencies. When you add to that all of the expectations around the aged care reform agenda, I think you have next level performance challenges. And what we collectively need to do is move to next level leadership and governance. And that's what this program is about. One message I want to send to all governing bodies is, is that we in the Commission want to work more closely with you to understand where you are in your journey towards be best practice governance. And I'd have to say over the last three years since we were established in January 2019, we've seen the best and the worst of the sector. And I'm speaking very plainly here. The best performing providers are awesome. They're outstanding and inspiring. The worst performing providers are shocking. They are alarming and hugely disappointing. Most providers sit somewhere in between those two ends of the spectrum, trying but not always succeeding to get things right. And in my optimistic take, reaching to do it better, just as Mike said, reaching to do it better. So I'm looking forward over coming months to expanding my engagement with boards and chief executive officers, along with my newly appointed assistant commissioner, Lisa Peterson. And we genuinely look forward to engaging with you on some of these key questions. But let me move to the value proposition for governing for aged care reform. With all the major reforms underway, it's absolutely vital that members of governing bodies and executives are match fit and ready to respond to both new obligations and more particularly new opportunities. Now you actually have a choice here in relation to the reforms and the way in which you engage with them. You could decide to ignore them. I would counsel you against that because I actually think that lie that way lies regulatory jeopardy. You could let them happen to you and then you could adjust your practices or accommodate them uh, as and when required, or you can lean in, participate, contribute actively to the processes of consultation, listening and weighing up perspectives, having your say, and then proactively implementing changes in anticipation of the reformal requirement to do so. And that last option, which is clearly the one I prefer, requires strong leadership and effective governance. And so that has motivated us in the Commission to work with our partners KPMG in co-designing with you, because you provided input, co-designing this program, Governing for Aged Care Reform. We've had consultations with the sector around the program and its content. We've designed it specifically with that input in mind to meet your expectations and your needs as you have articulated them. I commend the program to you and encourage not only you to sign up, but for you to talk to your colleagues and your peers and ask them whether they have signed up and encourage them to do the same if they're vacillating or, or somewhat indifferent about it. This is for all providers. And I really believe we have to lean in together to ensure that we get the lift which is available through this program to deliver the outcomes that older Australians have a right to expect, and they certainly deserve. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you very much, Commissioner Anderson, for those insights. I'd now like to share with you a short animation which um, provides an overview about the program. The context that aged care providers operate in is changing and new expectations for governing bodies and executives are emerging. Governing bodies and executives have a vital and significant role in enabling change and driving the transformation of aged care in Australia. Developed with your feedback and insights in mind, the Governing for Reform in Aged Care program has been designed to help approved providers of government-funded aged care services to strengthen their governance capability and mobilise those with influence to lead change from the top. Through this program, 
leaders like you are adopting new mindsets, capabilities and behaviours to deliver quality and safe care for older Australians. This is learning delivered differently. Starting with an individual diagnostic to tailor learning to your requirements and including social networks, workshops, tools and online learning. This program is designed with deep recognition of sector nuances. The program is free to members of governing bodies and executives of Commonwealth Government funded residential and home care approved providers. Enrol for the program today and be part of a collective effort to put the health, safety, well-being and outcomes for older Australians at the centre of our aged care sector. In partnering with the Commission on this program, KPMG has set up a dedicated team to work on the program with deep knowledge in governance and leadership and a commitment to support change to enable better outcomes now and in the future for older Australians. As we've seen in the animation, the program has been designed to be highly adaptive and responsive, and we've listened to you, the sector, in terms of designing the program. It is, involves multimodal delivery, which means that providers can engage on self-paced online and as well as face-to-face -face delivery. There are a number of different components on the program which were touched in the animation, but that includes a diagnostic tool to really help you um, understand and have a good awareness of what constitutes effective governance. We have cohort-based workshops, an online learning platform with learning modules, and a toolkit which, which will include information and better practice governance examples within aged care, as well as tools that will assist you as a governing body. Webinars will be conducted to address key issues that emerge throughout the course of the program. And we'll have action learning group to enable participants to share and learn from the experience of other providers, which we heard very strongly from our panelists is really essential for us to move forward as a sector. One-on-one -on -one support, coaching and advice and mentorship will be available for some providers as well um, throughout the course of the program. And we will also um, deliver some podcasts to provide some, provide some content for you to think about in terms of what we, where we need to go from an aged care perspective. So it provides a snapshot of what you can um, deliver, what you can expect for the program to be delivered. Now I want to share with you what you can expect as a program participant. There are going to be a number of different components um, around, the, um, around the program. And the first is that there are a number of fundamentals required um, around the governing for reform. So this phase is around building up core skills, mindsets and capabilities of governing bodies and executive members. It will introduce learners to the program and it will also focus um, on a range of different areas. And so that will include the diagnostic tool um, and four core online learning modules. Once complete, you will move into the Centre for Leaders in Aged Care. Um, and this is a very important part because it provides a range of additional learning opportunities. Um, it will help to strengthen your understanding of critical capability domains and their application. Learning within phase two will include deep dives into specific type of areas as well as social learning and learning within co cohorts and also require some reflective practice to actually help to embed the skills you've learnt into practice. On that note, that concludes the program preview and snapshot of how the program will be delivered. Um, on behalf of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, we thank you for showing your interest in the program. The program itself is highly, um, is highly valuable. It is government funded and a worthwhile commitment of your time. And I think listening to all of our speakers today, our panelists and the commissioner, as well as the minister, I think that has demonstrated some of the value that can, um, that will, can be expected from the program, given our changing sector um, and what we need to do going forward. If you have not already done so, ensure that you have enrolled in the program via the QR code on your screen, which will take you to the enrolment page and enable you to enrol right now. Once you have enrolled, please complete the diagnostic tool 
because this ensures that learners are admitted to appropriate cohorts based on time and maturity. We are calling for all providers within the sector, all approved aged care providers, whether you provide just home care, residential care, or a combination to participate in this program. Collectively, we will be able to make, um, make significant changes to the sector. So to support this, we'd also encourage you to share the program with your network and spread the word. Over the next six weeks, you will start to receive a range of pre-programmed content to engage with, which starts to explore some of the fundamental um, and foundational learnings and provides additional context to the program. It's also important to note that if you are concerned about capacity and having the time to undertake the program, the Governing for Reform um, in Aged Care is a sophisticated program with built-in supports to ensure that you can complete the program in your own time. If you have any questions about the program, please place them in the Q&A box and we will make sure that they are answered in our post-webinar Q&A document and email. Finally, I would like to thank um, our participants today. So Minister Colbeck, Commissioner Anderson, our panellists, um, Mike, Anne and Marie, and the team at the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission and to all of our participants who have joined us today. We look forward to seeing you all in the Governing for Reform in Aged Care program. Thank you.